and welcome to the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Season 7, Episode 21 on... Oh dear, oh dear, that didn't go too well. <laughs> In this episode, we will be talking to it Daniel... It even says 22. So, oh, it says 22. Sorry, I was expecting it to say the date, but it doesn't say the date on this show. That's why I'm getting confused. How many shows are you on? <laughs> it's all date. coming out now, isn't it? We say, we say the date on the first episode, don't we? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I was expecting to see that. Anyway, welcome to Season 7, Episode 22 of the Ubuntu Podcast. In this episode, we'll be talking to Daniel Holback from the Ubuntu community team, and we'll read your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat thing on the website and in the hash UPC IRC channel. I'm Mark, and joining me this week are Laura. Hello. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and Alan. Yeah, me as well. Yeah. Hello. not Tony. Yeah, no Tony this week. He'll be back soon. Oh. What have you been up to the, since the last show then, Laura? Uh, oh, I raised the bug. Just one? Uh, yeah. Slacker. Uh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, because I can't install updates on my laptop, Ooh. which is getting a bit annoying because every day it tells me there are updates and I can't install Is this install the one them. which you recently upgraded to 1404? Mm. So the box comes up and says you've got updates and you press the button. And it says there isn't enough space. Make <laughs> space. Oh, Ooh. have you got old kernels? Well, as old as 14 or 4, because I installed it from fresh oh. about less than a month ago. Interesting. And so then I run the command it tells me to run, and that makes no difference whatsoever the, sort of to remove kernels or something. Mm -hmm. And it says, empty your recycle bin, which didn't strike, me, <laughs> didn't strike me as probably being that useful, but I did it anyway, and it didn't make any difference. No, I think it means the one in the computer. <laughs> 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 I was going to say, because the council come every other week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so at the moment, yeah, I, so I raised the bug and I asked, it, got, it asked me for the airport stuff, so I did that and then it's gone quiet. Um, but there are people on Ubuntu, the questions. Ask Ubuntu. Yeah. Yes, um, saying something similar. Um, but the, on there, the answers are, oh, you just need to run this command to delete your kernels and things. And so I was like, I'm not doing that. I've only had this installed for, what, four weeks, something like that. Hmm. All right. That's so it shouldn't strange. have filled up so quickly. And did you did you overwrite your or reformat your boot partition when you reinstalled, or did you just use I'm, the old partition? I'm pretty sure I just did it, the whole thing, wiped it. Mm. I even wiped the home directory and everything. Mm. Um, it was I'm, As far as I can remember, it's completely fresh. I followed all the defaults and it's encrypted so. ah so it will have a separate boot then so yes but that's the default size of the boot all right mm. so again it's like it's mm. not anything i could have done have you tried rebooting yeah it reboots every day <laughs> <laughs> alan what have you been up to uh i've been playing old computer games on consoles oh which console? with my son uh so he's been playing uh like xbox 360 stuff and yep. wii stuff and then I said, uh, we were, I was playing one of the old Wii classic games uh, that you download yeah. from the Wii store. I think I was playing Donkey Kong Country, which yeah. is a Super Nintendo game. Yeah. Uh, I was playing it's that. One of the ones I, I fished out of a box the other week. Ah. Oh, yeah. And out of a skip. Uh, I was playing, playing that with him, yeah. and he really liked it. And I said, actually, I've got some, uh, I've got some GameCube games. I just remembered out of the blue that the Wii um, can play GameCube yeah. games. So I dug out a couple of GameCube games and a couple of GameCube controllers. And we sat and played uh, old Star Wars games and uh, Wave Race and stuff like that. It was oh, really was good. Was it uh, Rogue Squadron? Yep, Rogue yes. Squadron. Oh, that's a good game. And I also dug out my N64. And uh, I've got to GoldenEye to play yes. yet, which he hasn't played yet, but we will do. I watched a clip with Jimmy Fallon playing yes. uh, um, Piers Brosnan at GoldenEye. Yeah, <laughs> ah, brilliant. Yeah, it's a shame Piers was so terrible at it. But uh, yeah. it's not surprising, really, is it? Uh, I can't, I can't imagine him coming home from the pub drunk and playing N64 Goldeneye like I did 20 years ago, or however long ago it was. Yeah, but then you weren't playing James Bond. So. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Mark, what have you been doing? Uh, I went to the JISC Summer of Student Innovation, which I just got back from, which is why I'm so tired and reading all the wrong things. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, excuses. Okay. What so, happens there then? Um, it's, uh, well, you'll hear a little bit more about it next time because I did some interviews there. Oh, awesome. Um, but essentially it's uh, a programme for um, students to pitch ideas um, 
for projects to improve the student experience in some way and um, the best ideas get £5,000 and uh, sort of a mentorship programme over the summer to develop the idea into uh, hopefully a viable product or service. Oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah. So um, I, I interviewed... Um, Sorry, you said over the summer, yes. and you just got back on the twentieth of August. Well, this is this is one of the this is the end of it. No, what? well, this is um, this is the 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 second of three oh. summer schools. Awesome, and yes. have they developed cool stuff? Uh, but some of them have. Some of them are still sort of trying to actually work out because there's a, there's quite a lot of um, sort of iterative design and usability um, work going on to make sure they're actually developing something useful. Um, uh, cool. So some of it's still at that stage. Some of it is actually in the sort of deploying a, a test version to users stage. Um, so yeah, I spoke to a couple of the projects and the organisers as well. So you'll awesome. hear more about that next time. Awesome. Let's uh, get on with the rest of the show, I guess. <laughs> So on the line, I have Daniel Holbeck from the Ubuntu community team. Hello, Daniel. How are you? Hello. I'm good. How about yourself? Yeah, not bad. Um, in a break from our usual way of recording interviews, I'm doing this separately as a one-on-one -on -one with uh, with Daniel. And I wanted to talk to Daniel about uh, the Ubuntu Global Jam, which is coming up in September, right? Can you give us the the, the tweet size description of what Ubuntu Global Jam is? Uh, tweet size. Okay. Uh People around the world get together to make Ubuntu better. Brilliant. So these are not necessarily, it's not a canonical uh, internal uh, thing. This is a this is a community-based thing, right? Exactly. Um, we've been doing it for, I don't know, six, seven years now, for ages. Um, I think it was uh, George Castro's loco in the beginning who, who started this off. They were the first to have something called a packaging jam. And at some stage we thought, okay, we're going to turn this into a global jam. And it's just brilliant to see how teams in Egypt, in Myanmar, and all over the place uh, get together and they make Ubuntu better in the way they like to. So some people might like to do some translations, do some testing. Some people just get together, have fun, and have an install party. I mean, that's great as well. That's, not everything has to result in, let's say, uh, patches for, for packages or anything. Where that's, that's what we want to do. It's more about getting everyone together on the, the same weekend. And uh, that's what the Global Jam is going to be. So using the name Jam, obviously, this unsurprisingly came from <laughs> George. Uh, <laughs> it's It's got musical connotations. So it kind of makes you think that it's unstructured and, you know, people just hang out. Is there, is there structure to it or is it just, you know, you turn up and, you know, whatever happens, happens? Um, it's it's a letter, but... but Obviously, if you're a bigger local team and you have lots of people who have loads of different interests and you have somebody who says, OK, uh, everyone who's interested in technical bits, follow me. We're going to sit in this room and do this and that. Uh, that's great. But we had people just get together in a coffee shop or somebody who invited everyone to their home because he knew that there's going to be five people and they can easily come to his place, make some pizza. Uh, it was brilliant. And and. So when, when people arrive, is there kind of a set, you know, structure to that? Or is it is it just, um, you know, have a look at uh, any bugs in your favorite application or try and install something? Is there is there any like um, like a to do list that you would normally have on a on a global jam? Um, I guess it depends a bit um, what, what kind of people you, you're going to have there. If it's people who are brand new, who don't know how to start, don't know uh, where to get involved, what to do. You obviously want to give them a bit of an introduction and uh, just make sure that you maybe pair them up with somebody who, who already knows something or can uh, show them the ropes. Um, but if it's all friends of yours who know what they're doing, I mean, you don't need structure. You just tell them when the pizza break is. <laughs> so uh, so that's good in a way that, that people don't have to be you know, experts. They don't have to be a packaging expert or a translations expert or something. You can get people who are real newbies, beginners who just want to, you know, get involved. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so 
what I really like about the event is that um, every team they can make the event just how they like it. We uh, we put together some some documentation. So if you uh, want to have people working on translations or on documentation or something, we we give, give you uh, some introduction on, on how it might work well. But we're not saying if you have an event, uh, this is definitely how you have to do it. And that's what I like about it. And all the teams they made something. Uh, Main unique event for for their team out of it. So if we go through some of the things that um, that happen at a at a global jam, so one of the one of the things you've mentioned is is translations. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, that lends itself well to people in where in countries where English is not their first language. Um, right. So you know what can what can they do to get started on that? You know, there's it seems like there's a, a gigantic list of packages and a you know a huge amount of translation possibilities of all those little pieces of text all over the place. What would they do to get started? How would how would you bootstrap someone from nothing to something like that? So yeah, if you're organizing an event, if you think this is a great idea, want to invite some friends or uh, people from your Linux user group or uh, people from your university class, um, go to wiki.ubuntu.com slash Ubuntu Global Jam. And there we're going to, to list uh, a number of, of activities. For example, um, uh, if, if it's all about translations, we would uh, be obviously free to translate whatever you like, uh, but we're going to list some priorities. So for example, we might list some of the core apps, stuff you've been working on, or uh, right. other things that, that need to be translated. And the same goes for, for other projects. So if it's about testing, we're going to have a chat with the uh, QA people and ask them, what do you need tested? What is the most important thing? And we're going to uh, also leave some instructions for how to set up a testing jam, if you will, like uh, which, which ISOs to download or what to put on USB sticks so people can instantly try it out. We'll, we'll have all of that prepared. Okay, so it's not just a, a free for all. There is, you know, here, here are the the things that are, you know, what we consider to be the the most important things that need doing right now. You know, depending upon where you are in the cycle or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, but also, is is going to work well because um, people who are in the QA team we're going to uh, try to have them there in on IRC as well. So um, if it's the priority stuff for them, uh, they can also answer your questions when you're there. Right. So what about the more complicated things? I mean, uh, I mean it strikes me that a translation is is um, a fairly simple task that someone could do, you know, convert this word into another language, submit it and get it reviewed. Yeah. And you know, uh, you're talking to someone who only knows one language. So <laughs> 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 but something like more more uh, in depth, like um, packaging or um, writing autopilot tests or something like that, is that something you would expect people to do at a global jam as well, or is that you know too far off the, off the end of the scale? Sure. Let's let's say you you have a, a couple of people there who are interested in, in programming, for example. Um, Sure. Um, taking a, a small group of people through uh, the tutorials we have, like getting them set up for for packaging and, and how to or discuss the the structure of of a of a Debian package. Um, that's definitely something you can do, and something I'm working on, which I'm excited about. It's going to be uh, the first time we add this to the global jam. Is the uh, app dev schools or the uh, app developer training. So we're going to have a um, Materials there for for an app development training course. So um, if you set aside an, an afternoon, you should have enough time to go through the materials as a group and uh, write an Ubuntu app, which is going to work on the phone on the desktop. And uh, that's something I'm I'm excited about. So tell me tell me more about that. How, what um, what's the motivation behind creating these app dev schools? Um, in the past, it was it was a bit hard to write software for Ubuntu and get it into Ubuntu. Uh, first of all, you had to pick uh, some framework, so you would maybe use, I don't know, Python GTK or, or something else, and then uh, you would get it working. Um, then you would need somebody who can help you find package it. Then you would need to get a reviewer, somebody to sponsor it. Um, 
all, all these processes have suited us very well for Ubuntu in the in the last few years, where where we said okay, every bit of code that goes into into Ubuntu has to be reviewed by uh, the archive team and, and so on. But um, with, with with this new approach, where we have the possibility to run uh, confined apps, which means that nobody has to review them, we know that they're going to be safe. And uh, also the the choice of of language for for Ubuntu apps, QML makes it really easy to to write apps. So um, I expect that. Oh, I'm not alone. But we expect that. Uh, uh, once people learn more about this, we're going to have much, much more apps, beautiful apps, on the phone, on the desktop, on the laptop, everywhere, and it's just a, a matter of uploading them to the store, get them reviewed, and within seconds, they're there. So in the past, you might spend like a month developing your application in whatever language, whatever framework, and then what sort of time scale to get that into the archive? It depends. We've had a bit more bizarre packages sitting there for weeks, sometimes months, where you have always had this this uh, this ping pong discussion where you said, okay, uh, for which version is this? Okay, uh, now please fix this. And, it, and a month goes by and you have the fix and then blah, blah, blah. So it sometimes dragged on forever, which is right. frustrating for, for everyone because everyone puts time into this and you get nowhere. And this is Right. And so developers could lose interest because, you know, they find they're, they've written their code and now they want it just in, in Ubuntu and it takes too long, right? Yeah, exactly. So compare that to the what you're going to be showing in the app dev schools. What what kind of you know? Imagine you spend a month developing your application. What sort of timeline to get that deployed into the store and then onto someone's phone? You click a button, it will be <laughs> packaged. Magical robots do it for you. <laughs> exactly on your laptop in real time. Right. Um, uh, yeah, you upload it to the store, you have to sign up to the store, your name, address, blah, 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 and uh, then uh, some, some, some <laughs> the two of us review the apps. In the future, that's going to happen automatically, but uh, <laughs> it's Ellen and myself. Uh, but as soon as we hit the approve button, and it's very easy to uh, review those apps, uh, it's there. Right. Therefore, download. Okay, so what what would you cover in in the app dev school? Is this like a zero to hero, you know, from nothing? Someone could walk in off the street and write a bit of code and potentially stick it in the store. Almost. Uh, it's obviously going to help if you have a bit of uh, background knowledge about programming. Uh, if you have programmed before, that's that's obviously going to help, but you don't need a lot of of background there. Um, so what, what we'll cover in, in the um, in the classes is, is there's um, some material about uh, Ubuntu for phones because that's where we we were going right now and soon that's going to be on the desktop as well so we probably won't need that introduction anymore. Then uh, we we'll get everyone set up. So um, for some folks who who don't run Ubuntu natively, they have to get a virtual box and have that up and running. Uh, have the SDK installed, and uh, then some small introduction about QML, how it works, the general building blocks, so uh, the, the Ubuntu list view, main view, so, so those components, quick introduction, and from there on, uh, the rest is just about putting an app together uh, on your own. <laughs> and and are you going to be making these materials publicly available so anyone can run one of these classes? Exactly, exactly. So I would recommend that everyone who wants to run this, um, people who have a bit of uh, background information, or, uh, a bit of background in, in programming, it should be easy for you to prepare yourself to, to be a p teacher to, to give this presentation. So just a few days in advance should, uh, should, should be enough. Yeah, from then an afternoon should be enough. Awesome. Uh, so when is the next Ubuntu Global Jam and you know what what period of time does it cover? How long does it run for? So uh, it's going to be on uh, 12th to 14th of September, the entire weekend. Um, I could imagine that a lot of teams are going to do it on the on the Saturday. Uh, it really depends what, what suits your team oh, so best. It's not a requirement that you have to do it for the whole three days. It's not like you've got to lock everyone in a room for three days and feed them pizza and... 
That's it. If there's, I guess if there's enough coffee, that might work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, pick, pick any time that, that works well for, for your team. And uh, now I need to check my calendar. Or maybe you know off the top of your head, when was the uh, preparation session? Because we're going to have um, two hangouts on air where teams who want to um, learn more about how do I set this up, what do you need to, do you need to register, how does it all work, we're going to uh, give you all the details there. Ah, okay. So that'll be a hangout on air and you can find out when that is from ubuntuonair.com, I guess. Exactly, exactly. Right. And and so people could watch that to find out what they could do to prepare for an Ubuntu Global Jam, what they need and the kind of things people can do at a Global Jam, is that right? Exactly, as an, as an organizer. So um, these two hangouts are going to happen on Wednesday, the 27th of August. First one at 10 UTC and the second one on 19 UTC. Okay, so the they will be archived. If you're listening to this after the 27th of August, then those will be archived. And if you go to the Ubuntu On Air YouTube account, you'll be yes. able to watch them there. Yeah. Brilliant. Awesome. I think that's uh, everything we needed to know about the Global Jam. Thank you, Daniel. Awesome. Thanks a lot. All right. See you soon. Bye. Take care. Time for some command line love. <laughs> you sound ill. Oh dear. Yeah, Go on then, Mark. Hit me with some command line <coughs> love. Love. Oh. Um. Uh, this this week's is is SSH dash D, uh, with capital D, in fact, which uh, sets up a SOX proxy on local host on the specified port, which uh, allows you to browse the web from the host you are sshing to why would you do this um if you were behind um the, if if your web was filtered but you could ssh oh. to your server then you could use you could use your server as a proxy so you could have your server say um at home and your work um <laughs> for example if you were if, or if, you're, you're, if, you're, if you're at home and your internet connection is filtered by your isp oh yes okay or you live in a in a country where you have mandated filters there you go that's a much better example like the uk yes <laughs> and you have um you have yeah a, a server somewhere else which, so like which a v- any kind of external yeah, service outside your network yeah, so a vps for example so you could just have a uh, essentially a proxy that routes your traffic through that. So do you have to run Squid or something on the remote host or some proxy server on the remote host? Or is I it just... I guess it's just using SSHD. Oh, okay. So if you SSHD... So I'm at home and I've got a horrible filtered connection yeah. and my I don't like my ISP, yeah. but I can't be bothered to change ISP, but I want to route my packets around the filter. Yeah. I just SSH minus D um, and some remote host number and a port number yeah. and that remote host is my virtual server out in yeah. the cloud somewhere and then point my yeah you'd have to set up browser. you'd have to set up any applications which you want to use the proxy right um unless you can do it globally in um like the, the control or panel or something so whatever application i want to use whether it's like my browser to view i don't know a torrent site or something yeah. or whatever i can tell it to go to localhost 9000 or whatever exactly. port I run it on, and the traffic will pop out, will go down that tunnel and pop out on my remote site. Yes. And, oh, okay. And so the 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 server that I'm talking to, like, I don't know, Hulu or Netflix, yeah. will think I'm in the country wherever that host wherever is. Wherever your VPS is. is. So if I, if I spark up like a digital ocean VPS in the States yeah. for when I'm at home... Yeah. And then when I'm uh, in the US, I can spark up a DigitalOcean <laughs> or whoever VPS in, in the UK. To access the play. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. This is reminiscent of the time zone discussions we have. <laughs> it's not quite that painful. <laughs> uh, yeah, that came from Martin, by the way, on, uh, on um, the Twitters. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you Martin. Very much. That's a really interesting one. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> And now 
it's time for some feedback. Uh, Steve Smith Smithhurst sent us an email that concerned me slightly last week. Um, I add my voice to the chorus, nay, cr outcry over the missing command line love from the podcast. I bet you edited it out by mistake, didn't you? Ha, knew it. Okay, I got it from the show notes. What? Yeah, that was no. my reaction because I was like, we don't edit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we never, we just don't edit. And anymore. it can't just fall out. Yeah, I, I think maybe we muted the microphones for three minutes when the, yeah. that bit was on. The only Did thing we? I could think of was that we'd just completely forgotten to do it. At oh, all. Right. Anyway, Tony investigated and he says, check out 19 minutes, 49 seconds. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, so we did so do we it. Did it do is it. in there. I think Stephen's just fallen asleep. Oh, dear. So we're going to have to have a loud wake up klaxon at the start of Command I Love and not, <laughs> and not Mark's sultry go to bed sounds. Of oh, that's, what it, that's is. what it is. It's the uh, intro that sends people to sleep. That's what it I'll is. I'll just shout it next time. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Come on, you are a lot. Come on, I love. That kind of thing. Yes. Uh, Thank you for the email anyway, Steve. Uh, Robert Rise, I think I would pronounce that, uh, emailed to say, I bought my Samsung Arm Chromebook about 18 months ago from Best Buy in Los Angeles. It works very well. I'm even using it with the offline Gmail app to write this letter. I was impressed with the 1080p, 720p video playback on my HDTV, even using it in near 100 degree heat in my apartment. Wow. For a laptop with no cooling fan. Google has improved features in Chrome OS, and we now have an even nicer Chromebook models to buy. He goes on to talk about some of the drawbacks he's found, but mostly he's happy. He does mention, however, that you can use... Uh, you can use the Chromebook offline. Most of the apps do require internet access. He also uses it on Wi-Fi hotspots, so he's concerned about Russia requiring hotspots to track people's usage. Um, okay. Is that a thing? I don't know. If Apparently. This, if this would have happened in the US, he wouldn't use hotspots anymore, which would limit his Chromebook usefulness. Yeah, I guess if you're dependent upon third parties um, for your for your data, like, you know, often when I'm, when I'm in the pub, I'll often... Uh, use their Wi-Fi, mm. and you know potentially they could be sniffing all kinds of stuff that's going off my my phone or my I laptop. Think what he was talking about, and this sounds vaguely familiar, um, Russia have, have require any hotspot people to require a passport identity for any of their users so that they can track them. I think, well, wow. like that's what he said, and it sounds vaguely familiar. And I think that's what he's referring to. Oh right, okay, mm. but I don't know. David H emailed in. I was listening to the last podcast on my Ubuntu laptop and Chromium browser with the Chromecast plugin, Chromecasting the live podcast stream to my telly. Yay. Connected to my telly via an optical cable was my Denon surround sound AV amplifier and speakers. Get you. The podcast <laughs> sound quality was surprisingly good. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much. But I thought it lacked spatial separation. Have you considered using the pan knob? on the mixing desk to place each podcaster's microphone in a different position in the stereo image. Would it work if we just sat further apart? <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you move down the sofa a little bit. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no? Okay. No, I, I don't think that's how it works. Oh, okay. P.S. What would be truly awesome was if the, if the Ubuntu podcast was streamed in 5.1 surround sound. Oh, wow. it really wouldn't. <laughs> But well, you'd just get cake noises and tea slurping. <laughs> well, yeah, but you'd you know get the exactly where it background. was coming from. Oh, yeah, true. but if he's sat in the middle and, you know, there's, he, could, he could picture us sat in front of him and maybe, you know, the cat's behind and yeah. Mark slurping his tea in the background. <laughs> yeah. and, you we know, could just the, send him a photo. The dry cleaning guy knocking at the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the, it's the ambience that you get in that 5.1. I, I think it has merit. I think, I think the it idea does. has merit. You need to rear speakers for the cat. <laughs> the cat. Yes. <laughs> so to Tony says that we do actually have some stereo separation on the mic channels, although not too much because people complain if it's too extreme. Because if you've got a uh, rubbish little cheap MP3 player, then it might not work so well. Well, also because people get a bit unnerved by having someone panned really hard over in one ear and someone else panned really hard over uh, on the other ear. Yeah. It, it feels like you're talking through their head. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit weird. Also, if you've just not got a very good ear in one ear, it well, really there, annoys there people. Yeah. As well. Or if you're only use, wearing one earphone. Yeah. For whatever reason, True. then yeah. you miss half the conversation. I did, I did when I when I did the uh, interview earlier with um, with Daniel. I did pan me slightly one side and him slightly the other side, but not very much. I tried it a bit further, and it, it yeah, I'm not a sound engineer, so <laughs> it, it would have come out terrible. So yeah. So yeah, the short answer is we do, but not very much. Yes. 
Uh, and Tony suggests that you guess where we all sit. So I thought we should probably just swap. <laughs> move around the room yeah. what and then pan appropriately or just leave it just leave it just a few things right okay <laughs> okay moving on uh torin emailed to say i never warm to unity but generally do prefer distros based on ubuntu i rank zubuntu as the supreme xfc distro interesting i think this might have been a proposed discussion about lightweight things the other week. right yeah well we, we mentioned uh, ubuntu mate and a yeah, few others didn't we Yes. So awesome. Yes. Uh, I think uh, this week on the community um, hangout that was done by Mike uh, last week, Mike Hall and Nicholas Skaggs, I think they interviewed and had a and a with Liz Crumbach, Liz Joseph now, um, about uh, Ubuntu XFCE. So if you check out the Ubuntu On Air YouTube channel and scroll back to, I think... Uh, I guess it would be today or yesterday. Uh, yesterday, in fact, Wednesday the nineteenth of August, which is going to confuse everyone now. Day before yesterday. No, Tuesday the nineteenth of August. Oh my god! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then I you'll think find you a video. Read the nice feedback. Yeah, uh, Cone in the Netherlands uh, wrote in to say, "I've installed Ubuntu on my mum's computer. Almost everything works fine, except that printing jobs get stuck pretty often." It says printing page X says Ubuntu, while my printer seems to wait for data after grabbing the paper. There are also problems with printing at the organisation I volunteer for. They use Ubuntu, and often documents only get printing after issuing a job two times. So I was wondering, is it just me getting the impression of printing is difficult or underappreciated part of Ubuntu, or is it simply complex with proprietary drivers and many different hardware systems? So printers are devices for causing pain and anguish, and they also yeah. sometimes print stuff. <laughs> that that I would say, lucky. yeah. So, buy, buy an HP printer because they have good Linux drivers. So Ish. well, they sometimes they can be. Well, my my, I have an HP uh, laser, and I can't print from Ubuntu. Oh, really? I can I can print really? from OS ten and from Windows, but I can't print from oh. Ubuntu. It screws got, up. I've got a new um, HP multi function function yep. uh, photo smart printer. Yeah, I've got one. And I had to because it was new. I had to install the. <laughs> Did you get it with the my uni days discount by any chance? <laughs> No, no. I only found out about that afterwards. Oh. That was really annoying. Oh dear. You set her off. Um, no, um, but yeah, I had to install the HP Lib um, yeah. drivers separately because it didn't come with the 12 or 4 distribution. Right. And they were a little bit iffy and I had that problem oh, really? where I'd send it to print and sometimes it'd just stop halfway through a page for no apparent reason. See, but, I, I seem to be very lucky with printers. Well, 14 so, or 4 just works. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, so Cohen actually asks, is, is printing underappreciated? Well, we actually employ the printer guy tilt camputer so the linux printing guy who looks after openprinting.org and uh you know lots of printer drivers uh yeah we employ him so so no it's not underappreciated, <laughs> it's not underappreciated. So you give him lots of donuts we, and tea we love him very much and he loves printing very much and he will respond to your bug reports if you if you file them so cool. yeah if you have problems with uh, with printing let us stroke till no and uh yeah we'll get them fixed and i think that's the end of the feedback I think that might be the wrong <laughs> jingle. Sting. That was meant to be. Oh, okay. Yes. Should we try that again? <laughs> that. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that pleases, puzzles, or piques you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. The next live show will be on Wednesday, the 3rd of September at half eight, when I won't be here. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Oh, crikey. Come back, Tony. All is forgiven. <laughs> it's going to be just the two of us. Yeah, just the two of us. And maybe one or two guest presenters, or if we can I... if we can get a microphone that a cat can use, maybe <laughs> we'll get a cat. Yeah, she's been around. I'll be yeah. here in spirit. 
or recorded Own form. recorded, uh, yes. yeah, record loads of segments for us, Mark, and then we'll just top I'll tell and you tail what, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just record some phrases and you can slot them into the conversation. <laughs> Brilliant. Let's do that. 